Tell us how Carlos Sound came about. It uh, initiated, really, I guess, back in the roots uh, of uh, April of 1965, when I first met Richard Carpenter. I was performing in a nightclub in Knoxville, uh, Tennessee, which was my home. Uh, he and I were both going to the University of Tennessee at the time. Uh, I was already in that position in that club, and he came through the doorway looking at the stage, and I looked over across the way, and uh, I saw his demeanor and everything, and I thought immediately, that guy wants my job. So I figured out shortly that he was just more interested in being able to perform in that club. Uh, one thing led to another, and we ended up in the same group playing folk music uh, as, as it was in, in the mid-60s uh, in, this, in this club. And uh, we played there for a couple of years. And while we were there and going to the University of Tennessee, we uh, were also uh, asked to join a group called the UT Singers. And so we joined the UT Singers uh, and uh, the director, conductor, if you will, of the UT Singers was a fellow who had been <clears throat> touring with uh, a group called Fred Waring and the Pennsylvanians. Uh, Mr. Waring was uh, more well known from his work in the 40s and 50s. For, he was a much like a Lawrence Wilk type of vocal group. Um, but uh, this fellow, Ted Roberts, the director, uh, got an audition for us to perform for Mr. Waring when he came to town and played at the, the theater there in Knoxville. We performed for him, and uh, he liked what he heard and hired us to work at his Shawnee Inn at uh, Delaware Watergate, Pennsylvania. Actually, Shawnee, Pennsylvania. And we performed there during the summer, and at the end of the summer, he asked us to join and become Pennsylvanians and tour with him, which we did for a couple of years. In the process of that two years, he had a sound guy who was his engineer, and toured with him. And uh, <clears throat> he, uh, Bruce Kirby was his name. Uh, and he ended up, as we began to leave Waring and start our own touring stuff and doing things on our own as a band, uh, he sold us our, our electronics, our sound system. And so we used that uh, for the next, we left Waring in uh, July of 68. So we were there from 60, June, July of 66 through July of 68. And then in, uh, at that time, uh, we left and started our own group. We had, uh, we had uh, people behind us who were, uh, that we had met through our, 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 our association with Fred Waring. Gibson Guitars gave us instruments and uh, amplifiers, the whole lot. And uh, so we were, we, were doing, we were doing a promotional for their instruments and, and our band and whatnot. Fast forward to uh, December of 1969, uh, the Johnny Cash TV show was getting ready to start its second season. And they were doing that in the Opera House in Nashville. And uh, turned out that the guy who had the sound for the job or producing the sound in the Ryman Auditorium for the Johnny Cash TV show was the same guy who was the sound guy for Fred Waring. Well, they had a trucker strike and he couldn't get his equipment from Los Angeles to Nashville to start the show. So he knew us, he called us, could we rent your stuff to do the sound for the Johnny Cash TV show? And we said, well, yes, I think we can work that out. Uh, as it happened, just immediately prior to that, uh, Richard and I had been in a, a band that we were playing together in Huntsville, Alabama, December Christmas time stuff. And we were using the same sound system there that Bruce Kirby had sold us. So uh, in that process uh, of Christmas time and all, uh, uh, Richard went home to Nashville where his parents were living. I stayed down there because uh, 
<clears throat> because the coasters were coming, Cornell Gunther and the coasters, and they didn't have a sound system. So lo and behold, and for a period of two days, I got to be a coaster. <laughs> I played bass in the band and uh, yakety sax and don't talk back and all that uh, while having the sound system. And then the next, on New Year's Eve, I did sound for uh, uh, the Glenn Miller Orchestra. So those were the first sort of things, and they paid us to do that. It was like, wow, what a novel idea. So I called Richard and told him the money they were going to pay us. And he said, boy, that's, 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 a th that's a heck of an idea. And immediately on the heels of that, that's when Bruce Kirby called us about renting our sound equipment for the Johnny Cash TV show. show. So <clears throat> one thing led to another, and we did that. And uh, we were also members of the local IATSC, Local 46 here in Nashville. So we were working the stage for the cast show as well as having the sound system there. And uh, that was such an interesting way to, to, it was like jumping from one career to another immediately. Uh, and we did that until the show was over. And, uh, and then at that point we had, we had a, a, a sound company, if you will, but uh, on, on, we started Carlos Sound on January the 19th, 1970. So somewhere between that point at which we got involved with the Johnny Cash TV show and the 19th of January, we realized we had to have come up with a name. So uh, they had to write a check to somebody, and we didn't want it to be us because we didn't want the liability. So one thing led to another. We came up. We were sitting around a breakfast table, and I suggested to him, I said, well, I think for a sound company, maybe low car sound. What do you think about that? He said, no, I think low car sounds much too Neanderthal. And so, how about car low? And I said, I knew you'd do that. I knew you would do that. And so I was immediately dubbed the lower two-fifths of the Carlo group, although it was a 50-50 split. Uh, so that's how the name came about, Carpenter and Logan. And uh, the, the, we immediately got involved in doing uh, local stuff in town. Uh, I think the first live outdoor date we did was at Centennial Park here in Nashville uh, for, uh, oh my, uh, oh, I had that name of that band a second ago. Um, it's Evanest. I can't recall it. I will, though. Okay. Um, but that's that's uh, that's the beginnings, that's the the, the very early moments of it. Um, um, so your partnership with with Rich Carpenter came about extremely organically. Um, what did that look like in the company um, in terms of who handled what? We were both hands on throughout the entire thing. Uh, he really did most of the booking for it. But he was also on the road. He and I were both uh, touring. There was a period of time in the 70s when we didn't see each other for 13 months, going out on different tours. And we ran into each other in O'Hare one day, him going with one band and I'm going with another. And uh, we said hello and shook hands. And it was another couple of months before we saw one another. Because we had, uh, we had, at that point in time, developed into two sound systems. He would take one and I would take another. Eventually we had four or five uh, with groups going around the country doing this. And uh, eventually we, we toured Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Europe, all that. Much like a lot of the other sound companies did. We had our groups and uh, they had their groups and that's, that's sort of what, what drove all of that. How did the, uh, the progression in terms of what kind of venues you could handle how did that progress? Organically, again, uh, it was driven by the need that we would be told in front what we were going to be up against in terms of venue size, and we would get more stuff, and we would grow it that way. Uh, I remember the specifically uh, a gig that I did in uh, 
in Providence, Rhode Island, they had a basketball arena there that was right downtown. It was kind of in a pit. And so the, 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 the room went up like this on either side. It was very close. It was, they didn't use a lot of left or right real estate. And so the promoter insisted that we put together a flying sound system. We didn't have a flying sound system. In the early days, uh, all of our Amperacs were at the house console and you ran long speaker cables, you know. The, but for that particular gig, and that's that we did in Providence, uh, we, had to, we had to create snakes that we could fly, speaker snakes that would go up in the air from, their sound, from the racks that we would set on the stage, stage left, stage right wing. And so in order to build them, uh, the, and we were on the road with another group at the time, uh, I remember very, vividly soldering connectors on zip cord while flying on an airplane using our butane torch uh, soldering irons sitting in the seats. There was no other way to do it. We didn't have enough time. So we would, we would, we would do that on the plane and, and then when we get to the hotel room, keep going. And it was very primitive. It was very... Uh, but we made it, and the gig got done, and then we realized the impact, which we did not realize at the time, the impact on blocked seats in terms of the promoter. Uh, and that was our first eye-opening experience of, oh yeah, I guess that's pretty important. So uh, that, led, that led to us creating sound systems that would fly, and uh, a reorganization of how we built them. Did you build your own? We did. Your we, own did. Boxes, all that? Yeah. we did. We uh, did. I remember specifically a uh, a design that we had, which was a, uh, a exponential flare horn, uh, mid horn, that was made up of two JBL twenty one thirty speakers. Um, facing forward uh, at the rear of the cabin, so it was front-loaded, and uh, it, it was a very innovative design for those days. And it, uh, it, was, it, it allowed us to play much bigger venues because of the way it would throw. Uh, using a, a horn with speakers was a little bit different. And so I remember specifically a show that I did at the Shrine Auditorium in Los Angeles where at the end of the show, the uh, stagehands were crawling all over those cabinets with tape measures. And uh, yeah, it was really interesting. We had, that wasn't the only show, but I remember that one specifically. So yeah, and then it wasn't until about 19, mm, let's see, 1979, I guess, when we started getting involved with Eastern Acoustic Works right in there with Kenton Forsyth and Ken Berger. Uh, we did uh, a lot of review of their BH215 cabinet, which was such a beautifully designed musical cabinet. And we, we loved that. And from that, we developed the, what was later called the CS3, Carlos Sound 3-Way. It was a horn-loaded bass mid-high. Uh, all in one box that weighed 422 pounds, but and made of 13 ply Baltic birch, uh, voidless, and it was just solid as could be. Uh, they are they were all on casters, fortunately, but uh, they were all built to hang. So you have the the motors come down, you get your uh, hooks on either side, lift, then you get more hooks. Up it goes. Uh, so, uh, and that whole thing just started from that one gig that I had to deal with the soldering on the plane. Uh, later, uh, let's see, in 1976 through 1978, we, uh, we had a sound system in Hawaii. We sent it uh, to uh, Honolulu and partnered with a company called Odyssey in those days, and uh, we did a lot of things at the 
Hawaii International Coliseum, the HIC. I believe it was Neil Blaisdell Center at the time, but we had a sound system out there for two years and a guy living there, and we would fly out every third or fourth month to check on it. But uh, that was a mid '70s thing, so we had a, we had a lot had a lot of fun with it. But it was it was time to come back after a couple of years. How many people did you have working for you at that time, or throughout the? History? Let's see. Well, uh, initially, in the very beginning, of course, it was Richard and me. Uh, and then we hired a guy named Bill Borgerson. Bill now is in real estate and, com and construction. Uh, and doing quite well, as I understand it. Uh, but it was the three of us for a while. Our first main, uh, our first, I guess the first group we toured with a lot was the Allman Brothers Band. We, we connected with them and did a number of years with them. Uh, it was a very, very good relationship. Uh, we were, I'll put it this way, uh, in, uh, just before Dwayne died, two weeks before he died, we were doing a show with him in the Auditorium Theater in Chicago. And at the end of that show, uh, as I was doing, winding up cables on the stage and Richard was at the console of the house, Dwayne came to me and he said, you all got a few minutes, I'd like to talk to you. So we said, sure. Uh, and so after about 10 minutes or 15, um, Dwayne and I go up to the console area where Richard is continuing to wind cables and whatnot. He sits down on the stairs and we're sitting on whatever we're sitting on and, and he says, I'd like to make an offer to you. And we said, okay, what is it? And he said, well, I'd like you guys to uh, put up your sound company and $10,000 and I will put up 50% of the Allman Brothers Band, profits going forward. If you go, to, for, go with that, uh, we have a partnership, and we'll go with that from now on. So we shook hands on it, uh, agreed to do it, and within 10 days he was killed. So it's 1971. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was, we were really... We were very close with him. In fact, we were asked to be pallbearers for Dwayne. I couldn't do it, I was on the road. Uh, but Richard was a pallbearer. And then when Barry died, once again, they asked us to be pallbearers, and we were. And I uh, helped carry Barry to the grave. It was, it was very, very tight, very tight with him. I think the last show I did with them was in uh, Mm -mm -mm. It was RFK Stadium in D.C. It was the Allman Brothers Band and the Grateful Dead. And I think that was June 3rd and 4th, I believe. 1976, I believe. I still have the rooming list. Mm -hmm. So I have a door that I kept and put all these stage passes on from shows, it's at my home now. Uh, and uh, a lot of, a lot of shows, a lot, yeah. lot of shows. Who were, uh, can you name several of the artists you worked with during the couple of years? Uh, yes, uh, there were literally a couple hundred, mm -hmm. but the ones that we toured with the most, my experience was, uh, mostly with uh, the Allman Brothers Band. Uh, uh, Procol Harum. Uh, uh, Dan Fogelberg. Jackson Brown. Poco. The Eagles. Uh, boy, who else? Uh, Ozark Mountain Daredevils. Uh, Black Oak, Arkansas. Uh, there were so many. Uh, those are the ones that come immediately to mind. I will share with you that uh, one story that I'm... It's funny how all of this is happening right about now. 
because uh, I, I, I haven't thought about my career back in those days at all until within the last month. And suddenly within the last month, there's, there's this. There's a, a fellow who uh, is doing a doctoral uh, thesis on the history of live sound in the United States. He's in England. And he found me and is, I'm interviewing with him a week from today to get information about how, you know, whatever would be useful to him. Yeah. And uh, in the same time frame, I learned that uh, Jean Fogelberg, Dan's wife, uh, is releasing an album of the performance he did at Carnegie Hall in New York City. Uh, and the backstory to that is the really, it, it's, the backstory to that is uh, he, uh, when it came time to do that show, he, they had a nine foot Steinway on stage, signed Steinway. But he was so nervous about doing that show, he said, no, I'm, I'm not playing that. I want my piano off the truck. So he got that, and uh, their management were trying, were, they were trying to get him to record it. And he said, no, I can't do that. I'm too nervous. I don't want to have to deal with thinking about that. I just want to do the show. So he did, but because I felt like I knew Dan well enough, he and I did a lot of things together besides that. Uh, we, uh, I put a cassette in the my recorder at the board, and I recorded the show. And I, for reasons, I, 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 I didn't give it to him that night. I gave it to him the next day or the day after that. And uh, fast forward to uh, last August, when Jean was going through, his wife, going through memorabilia, and she found that cassette. And at that point, then she started the ball rolling to try to release an album of him live at Carnegie Hall. So and much, uh, much thing, many things went down to get to the point to release it, but now they are in fact releasing that album uh, right about now. And uh, I'm, I'm, and I'm sorry, yes, from my board cassette. That's awesome. And uh, it is, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting album credits. So, yeah. What the heck? You <laughs> so, yeah, and I, I finally connected with Gene on Facebook. I have other cassettes of that show and lots of other artists that I've worked with. Um, one of my favorite shows, aside from the ones I've told you about, uh, was with the Allman Brothers when uh, <clears throat> on uh, April 16th, 1972, they played the... Uh, Capitol Theater, no, not the Capitol Theater. It was the first show they did in New York City after Dwayne was killed. And uh, uh, Dickie was nervous as could be about doing that show. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, as it turned out, he, uh, he played his ass off. It was great. It was wonderful. The whole band was just really on it. And I recorded that one and I, uh, I got to keep that one. And uh, some of the licks he played on that uh, were just remarkable. remarkable. I told him when I saw him about, uh, oh heavens, 25 years ago, uh, maybe 30, that I would get him a copy of that tape. And I'm, well, I haven't died yet, so I could, supposedly I could still do that. Uh, but uh, he, uh, uh, they, the, all, when Carlo moved from our location at 320 Fifth Avenue South to Two Music Circle East, which is where the tracking room is now, we also had rehearsal studios. And so the Alma Brothers Band, every, name them, they all went through their rehearsing. And so that's, that's when I promised Dickie I would get him a copy of that. And that would have been about 1982, 
84, somewhere in there. So uh, anyway, that was a, that was a that was a that was a wonderful show. Did you do? Um, let me ask one more question. Uh, did you do any festivals? Provide sound and engineering for festivals around the country. <sighs> We uh, we did not do any of the large festivals. Um, we were uh, at that point. Uh, we had four sound systems, and they were all busy working with different groups, and we didn't have the luxury of being able to assemble them all into one spot at one time. Yeah. So it was just not possible. Uh, we attended them in terms of being with a band that would play there. But we didn't we didn't provide gear for those. That was other groups, other. And I have to take a hat off and hand it to Bill Hanley for what he did at Woodstock because really that's from my from my side of the foot from my side of the footlights. I should know better, right? <laughs> uh, from my side of the footlights, uh, what he did there was so. Um, it was foundational to what I think the rest of us got to do. I know that his W boxes that he had there, uh, they finally came through Nashville at one point in time, and we did what others did to us with that, that double bass. We went down and measured his W boxes and reproduced them. And that's the way we got that low end that we had. Uh, uh, you know, in, in those days, there weren't high frequency drivers that would you could put on a horn and get anything above 6k so you, you, you so it, it, then there were of course the uh the piezoelectric tweeters that people started using to try to get some high end in it but higher the frequency the tighter the cue and so you do an array that did this you know to try to spread it out so once we had that low end figured out, and that was really, that was the first thing we did. Those things weighed 300 pounds a piece and, you know, seven and a half feet long, 36 inches tall and 30 inches deep. And uh, Richard and I used to carry them, the two of us, pick them up and move. And those are the days before, before, before stagehands. There weren't any stagehands. You wanted it, you moved it. So, uh, one of the one of the other things that we did that was a hoot with those. Of course, people used to crawl up inside the bass bins because it was they take some psychedelic whatever it was. And <laughs> so uh, one of the one of the uh, shows we did with those uh, um, uh, all that low end that we had with those W boxes, we did Ike and Tina Turner for quite a while. That was another band I toured with a lot. Um, and uh, Ike and Tina, well, as soon as Ike Turner heard that low end, was, that was the time when he was doing Rolling on a River. And, and man, he came out to the board that night, that first night, and it was at the old municipal auditorium in Atlanta. And he came out to the board and uh, said, I want you guys to tour with me and all that. So we did and all that. And that, that, that led to a friendship that, with Ike and Tina and the Ikeettes and the band and all that. So. That was that was an interesting moment with them. Can you tell us about this picture? Yeah, that that picture, Exhibit A. <laughs> uh, that picture occurred on November the fourth, nineteen seventy six, uh, on this uh, Smyrna. There's an airfield there. Uh, it, at that time, was not active. They might have had an occasional plane land, but it was not an active runway. It was just the ramp. Um, we took that picture uh, as a uh, as our company was expanding into also doing transportation. At that point in time, we had the sound company. We also had a Carlo Cases case company, and we were doing transportation as well, where we would rent the aircraft and and or the truck or the bus and and take people around. Uh, and so this was a moment to capture that and use it as a promo. Uh, I think that picture may have been in the, it's in a few magazines, I've seen it around. But uh, it, uh, it was interesting because it's the first time that I was ever had any time to spend alone with the woman I would end up marrying and be married to for 38 years. So she and I were, <clears throat> she was dating, 
one of the guys that worked for me at the, at the time. And, uh, and so we went to go, uh, we were looking for the truck driver. He was late. And so she said, well, I'll see if I can go find him. And I said, well, why don't I get in the car and go with you? Because I already had a crush on her, of course. So we, we got in the car and we went out and we found the truck driver and we came right back because everybody was standing around in this cold air, <clears throat> November air in the morning. Plus the fact that I, had, I was on tour with Jackson Brown at the time. We had just played Birmingham the night before. I'd driven here and had to go load in and do the show at the Ryman, I mean at the, at the Opry House, the new one, at that time new one. So I didn't have much time, but it was a, a fun moment. Well, fast forward to uh, uh, March of last year, when the guy who was driving that truck had passed away. And so we attended the funeral. But just prior to going to the funeral, I, I'd spoken to my wife and I said, uh, remembering that day, uh, and uh, she said, yeah, that was a special day. And so when it came time at the funeral for us to, anyone like to say a word, uh, and his brother, Tim Cotton was the driver, his brother's Gene Cotton. And uh, so when it came time to say a word, Gene kept looking at me and finally handed me the microphone. So I said what I said, I started off by on November the 4th, 1976. Mm -hmm. And I told the story that I've related to you about the first chance to be with my future wife. <clears throat> and, uh, and then I related to the, to the crowd, this, uh, I said, you know, I've been married to her for all these years, and it wasn't until last week that she told me that she went there to see Tim Cotton. She didn't come there to see me. <laughs> so uh, it was a, kind of a, a strange moment, but it was a, it was a, a relief moment in, in, the, in the process of that event. So, yeah, that was, uh, that's, how that, that's the history behind that picture. There was a comment under the picture uh, where we found out that said, yes, but Carlos Sound's horn rig would have killed those uh, little WM columns on Pink Floyd's cover. I still remember the white six-octave rotary potty cues Carlos used back then. Yeah. The, those were white, uh, uh, white equalizers. They had rotary pots. Um, white, they were out of Austin, Texas. Uh, white Instrument Company. They also uh, produced uh, later real-time analyzers and all that other stuff. Great electronics, great electronics. A lot, in those days, most equalizers, if you move the pot, would go <laughs> Theirs didn't. They were, they were sealed pots, they were silent, and they worked, they did what they said they would do. And uh, so, yeah, we, uh, we did uh, a few shows with Pink Floyd in their early days, and they came out with, uh, they had the WEM stuff that they, they may have been given that stuff for promotional or whatever. I know that they, uh, they had that, and I know that uh, when we worked so much with uh, the Carpenters, Karen and Richard, they had a Shure, they, they, they worked with Shure, and they gave them a vocal master. Uh, and when we would do shows with them, they'd have to set up the columns on either side of the stage just so it would look good. You know, they were never turned on, but uh, they had to look, and then we'd have our massive array of stuff. So they weren't the only people who were using uh, other electronics, but they were right. I mean, the stuff that, the, the WAM stuff that they were using was not horn loaded. It couldn't, it, it was more intended for a near field, not far field. It couldn't, it couldn't carry the distance. So that's referencing a similar picture to this one that was on the, the Pink Floyd Uma Guma album. Uh, was this inspired by that picture? Or did you no, I never knew about that until, until I, the, the, I was, it was all brand new to me. I, okay. I thought I had a picture of it here somewhere. But uh, no, I, 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 no, it was not inspired by that. This was total serendipity. We had just out of the blue. And the guy who was taking the picture, actually, a uh, uh, guy named Slick Lawson, uh, you asked about Richard Carpenter's wife, Margaret. Well, before Richard and Margaret Carpenter got married, Margaret used to date the guy who's taking this picture. Uh -huh. 
so I mean, it was just, it's just so funny the way the 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 worlds intertwined. It was funny. Uh, when did Carlos Sound dissolve, or when did it transform into what he did after it? Uh, that was November twenty eighth, nineteen nineteen. 94, um, I, Richard and I at that point in time didn't see completely eye to eye. Um, we'd been through a lot of stuff together for a long time and over 30 years. And uh, he wanted to continue doing what, he, what, the, what we had been doing. And I just, I was dying. I, just, I can't do this anymore. I've got to do something else. And so I gave 100% of everything to him. I said, you can have it all. I don't want anything. I just want to start my own company. And so I did. Well, on February the 1st. Uh, and so, of 95. And so one thing led to another and I got to the point with that company, very blessed with work. Uh, we got so busy and, and, and it's, it's continued to do this. I, I couldn't manage it anymore. We were going to either have to majorly expand. We already had 20 people. We were going to have to get 50. And we just, I, could, I didn't want to deal with it anymore, not at my age. Uh, it was just more than I cared to deal with. And my wife felt the same way. So that's when we ended up selling to M3. And M3 is, a, is what I'm currently doing as a liaison now. Uh, it's a combination of Logan Media and M3 sort of melding things together in the logo that, that we don't have it finished yet, but it's coming. It will say M3 and uh, Logan Media, one family together now, and that kind of thing. And uh, I, I, I don't know that I've been this happy in a long, long time. Uh, I loved working my own company. Love the people I worked with, uh, love the client base, uh, but now I love the freedom to not do nearly as much or worry about it financially. Uh, I've got a great relationship here. And it's, M3 is a, I, I had been pursued by three or four different companies to sell my company, and I just, I hadn't found the right match yet, and including M3, I hadn't felt like I was ready for it yet. So I finally got to the point where I said, I have to do this. And so my wife and I both agreed. And so we, on the January 3rd of this year, I, I sold it. We sold it. And uh, we are happy. <laughs> I'm glad. What happened to Richard and Carlos Sound after you <sighs> solved your happiness? Richard, um, <sighs> I didn't pay much attention to it, honestly. Uh, I know that he, at that point, I think had, I think he had sold the Count Sound Company, the, no, yes, 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 that's right. We, I forgot about that. Wow, I haven't thought about this in a long time. We sold the Sound Company, not the name, but the equipment, all the equipment, to Lee Brantley of Brantley Sound Associates. They got all the equipment and we also gave them the Oak Ridge Boys account, which was the one main account that we had at the time. Uh, so, and the Oak Ridge Boys were happy with that. Everyone was happy with that. So it was one of those things where really the, the only thing left that was really making money still was the case company. And he liked that a lot. He, Richard had grown up as a mechanical engineer, and uh, so he was very much into that. But it was just not something that I could, I could, I could, it was not my cup of tea. So he stayed with that until he passed away. Uh, oddly enough, it was 20 years ago on the 25th of April, he passed away, so. So, 97? Mm-hmm. Age 52. 
Yeah, I've seen more people die at age 52, men, than uh, I care to talk about. It's a, it's a critical age for males. Um, back to gear a little bit, what kind of consoles did you use? Oh, uh, the consoles that we started with were, uh, the first one was an Altec 1592A. It was a solid state mixer, five inputs. So we built a console that had four of them. And no, this was before the invention of monitor mixes on stage, mind you. This was only house. And this was before we learned about DB pads, uh, protecting inputs, you know, sensitivity. And so we, uh, and we also used, uh, uh, for amplifiers, we used Altec 1569 uh, and 1570B. The 1570B was a, a behemoth that weighed, I don't know, 90 pounds, 100 pounds, something. Anyway, when you move 10 or 12 of them, you, you know it. Uh, and uh, 180 watts, mono. And then the 1569, I believe, was 60 watts a channel or something like that, which we thought was, wow, that much? And we kept all of the amplifiers at the house console and ran speaker cable to the stage. And our console was typically 75 feet from the stage. So the wiring alone to make it go from, we would sit house right or house left to go all the way. Uh, it was, it's what we did because the amps were not that reliable. We carried spares and set them right there by the console so that when, not if, one of them died, we just, here, put it right back in there. So, yeah, we, and in those days, the, the 1592A was the first workhorse mixer that we used. Uh, after the 1592, we went with uh, Stevenson Electronics, Lou Stevenson, uh, and his company was uh, out of Houston. Uh, and uh, we used their boards. I'll tell you a little story about that one. Oh boy, uh, <clears throat> we, we used those boards quite a bit. And uh, they were modular, so you could actually take the modules out and look at them and look at the motherboard and all that. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, at one point in time, uh, this was about 1975, somewhere in there, uh, I was out on the road with Poco. Uh, America was another band I toured with all the time. And uh, so I was, in, I was in Springfield, Massachusetts, and they were going to do this live opening at the uh, Hollywood Bowl for the release of their album, their new album. And Poco and America had the same management company. And so some, they would move tours around a day or two just to make sure I could be there for that group or that group or whatever. And so um, it came time for this show to occur at, uh, at the Hollywood Bowl, and they flew me from Massachusetts out to LA to do that. Well, I got as far as Chicago, and I got on the plane, it was a DC-10, and we got up about, oh, we've been in the air about mm, three, four minutes. When, and I was riding first class because they were flying me that way because of all the flying I was about that. I had to go right back to East Tennessee right as soon as I quit the thing in L.A. So uh, we got, about, we got <laughs> about five minutes into the flight, and I was watching the pilot on the screen in front of me, and suddenly he takes his hand and he goes like this, and he rubs his cap off his head, and, uh, the, the, guy, and uh, the guy on my right he and I were both listening to the transmission between them. Well, what it was was they had had a fire on their number two engine, and they were going to have to circle back and land back at, at O'Hare. And so they called out the equipment and all the rest of it, and we were like, oh, great. I guess I'm going to be late to the... Well, we ended up landing, and everything turned out fine. They, they said, we'll be leaving in about 10 minutes. Please stay where you are. And I said, no, not going to do that. I'm leaving. <laughs> So I got off the plane and I got on a 707, which is the workhorse in those days, just one gate away, 
going to the same destination. So I did that. I made it, got to LA, got a limo to the, to the gig at the Hollywood Bowl, got there in time for me to uh, get to the, the, the console uh, with the two guys that I had on the road with it at the time, and the guy who was the front of house fellow at the most of the time, uh, announced to me, the console has died. Well, rats. Here we were. Uh, they've flown me all across the country to do this. It's at the Hollywood Bowl, the big release, and George Martin is there to do the mix. And so I'm, I'm looking at the board, I'm looking at the situation, and I'm thinking, this is not the time to panic. This is the time to put your head down and think. So I pulled out the master module, and, uh, and I looked at the chips that were, in fact, controlling it. And there was a, I believe the part number was an LF353N, the chip that was the uh, master control of it. And we carried, a, we carried a plastic tube that had plenty of them. And so I took the thing, a master module, and I'm throwing chips around it, and I'm putting new ones in as fast as I can. And about the time I'm putting in the last chip, I see George Martin coming up from the stage to start doing the rehearsal for the sound check. So I hurriedly got that module back in the board, put the screws into the module, hadn't, done, hadn't even turned it on yet as he's approaching. Do turn it on, hadn't tested it. He walks up and said, hello, and all that, and we shook hands and a few happy words and this and that. Uh, and then uh, he raises the fader, and I'm waiting, please, Lord, let there be some sound come up when he raises that fader, and it worked. It was literally honest to God to that wire. Uh, and and I, I was, they had a balloons, hot air balloons, they had, I don't know, I felt everything. Spotlights, the whole thing. Well, I stayed long enough I had a flight to catch to go back to East Tennessee, and the flight left about 7.30. So about 4.30, I left there to go back to East Tennessee, or the East Coast. And uh, what I didn't know what was, going, what was about to happen, the sound system worked perfectly. There was nothing wrong. That worked great. But that particular show was the first show that they had done at the Hollywood Bowl where they had, uh, codes department, had set a limit of 80 decibels, no louder than 80 dB, at the rear of the park. So at the rear of the bowl. So you can imagine, I mean, it was louder than that coming off just their guitars. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, and I had, I, before I had left, I'd heard them practicing and talked to Dewey and, uh, several of the other guys in the band. I said, you guys are going to have to turn them way down. It's, this, you just, we can't, you're in the bowl, you get set up like this, it's like you don't want to play that loud. So, but I still didn't know about that rule yet. So I left and then it turned out it was, uh, from what I understood, um, not a very pleasant evening. Uh, but uh, for all the pomp and circumstance and everything that went down to get that to get the bowl, to get George Martin, to get fly me back and forth, and whatever else they did, I don't know. Just, I'm just glad I wasn't there for that. <laughs> glad I wasn't there for that. So, but I did make it back for the, the next date for the Poco, so that was good. Yeah. That's good. I won. That's all you wanted to do. I won. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's pick up with Harrison. When did you switch to Harrison consoles? Ah, uh, we switched to Harrison consoles. Uh, around 1979, 78, right in there, uh, about the time we started working with Eastern Acoustic Works. Um, and it was almost concomitant. So, uh, and it was a lovely thing. I, uh, Dave Harrison came over to our house one night when he was just coming out with his new, not the Alive series, but just Harrison Boards. Uh, he knew us from 
the work we had done and who we were in Nashville and all that. And uh, he was just so proud of his, uh, what he had done, especially with the voltage, voltage control faders and all that. And uh, we, of course, were totally enamored with what he was coming up with and developing. And we said we would love to entertain the idea of using your work whenever you actually finish and make it. Well, it took another couple of years or so for him to do that. But uh, we ended up using their boards, and it was a wonderful, wonderful thing. They, had, they were very quiet, very responsive, true to their EQ and everything. It was great. So around 78, somewhere in there. Uh, and that was a time also that we began to connect with, as I said, Kenton Forsyth and Kim Berger with the AW. And you used the Alive Series 24 and then 32 channel version? That's correct. Okay. That's correct. We started with 24 and then ended up with, with several 32s. And uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. We did uh, uh, one of the, well, we started touring with Cash and Johnny Cash in uh, 1981 and the Oak Ridge Boys in 1981, uh, and, uh, and then Ricky Skaggs, and then I don't remember who all. The last, the last group or artist that I worked with was Mark Chestnut. I, I did audio, uh, front of house only. Uh, I think the last thing I did with him was 92, I think, somewhere in there. I followed him around. Uh, he was doing a run of summer run of stuff in Canada, as I recall. Some, some in the upper, the northeast uh, United States. But uh, Chestnut was the last live sound thing I did. I, I, I knew my hearing was failing, and I just I didn't want to embarrass them or me or myself. So I didn't. I, I stopped. Uh, you were still using Harrison consoles at that time. Uh, yes. Yes, I just I just knew that it was not for me to do anymore. Yeah. When you don't hear it well enough, you don't. You know. I had to turn down a uh, when Poco came to Nashville to do a a, a live gig uh, that they were coming back out to start a new something in I, the year about 1982 or three, and they asked if I would mix them in the house. It was a Deepak, one of their theaters. And I regrettably had to decline. I, I hated that, but uh, I did a lot of stuff with that group, including playing, co-writing a song with Tim Schmidt that was on their, uh, one of their albums, and playing five-string banjo on two or three of their songs. Uh, it was Rose of Cimarron album. So I was... Um, very close with all of that group for a very long time. That was a that was a a lot of fun. A lot of fun. <laughs>